When I was a boy, we used to visit my grandparents on a Sunday. On the way there, we passed under a low bridge and my parents sometimes mentioned that it was the route of Lady Wimborne's private road to Bournemouth. This meant nothing to me as a kid, but it's something I've thought about recently. Because of COVID-19, I've been out and about on my old bike that's been in the garage for at least a decade and no longer in its prime. Looking for new routes to explore, I decided to find out if the story about the private road was true, and if so, to see if I could cycle it. In short, yes, the road existed, and yes, I've cycled as much of it as possible. Lady Wimborne's Camford estate is probably more important than you might think. Most of Poole, Wimborne and the western part of Bournemouth is built on the grounds of the former estate and there are still many signs of the past around us. What I'm doing with this film is to combine my hobbies of cycling and photography with my love of gadgets to make a film about the road, past and present. En route, I'm going to talk about the history of the road, the people behind it and the Camford estate. I hope you enjoy the film. Let's get going. There's some debate online about exactly where in Bournemouth the road went to. It was this point, the junction between Wallace Down Road and Scotch Road. I'm relying on two sources here. Firstly, my mum. She's 90 and refusing to get old. And secondly, ordnance survey maps from the early to mid 1900s. The borderline between Bournemouth and Poole is the middle of Wallace Down Road. So I'm filming from Bournemouth and the opposite side of the road is Poole. So it most certainly went to Bournemouth just. As we'll discover, the estate was huge, so there were several roads and entrances to the estate. However, this was a grand entrance. The lodges and gates were built in 1909. My mum remembers cycling past the entrance gates with a friend. The road was built to reduce the distance between the manor and Bournemouth. It took two years to build and opened in 1910. The road took the line of Wallace Down Road to start with, heading towards the junction of Rally Road and Bembro Crescent. It crossed onto Bourne Valley halfway along Bembro Crescent, then followed the Bourne Stream to the bottom of Leyland Road, curving north to run between Wallace Down Road and Lowry Crescent. The bridge that inspired this film then crossed over Ringwood Road. So it's time to get on the bike. As the area has become more and more built up, more and more of the road has disappeared. Thankfully, this first section is the only bit where there is virtually nothing left. I've done a lot of research for this film and version one had me reading it out word for word. That didn't really work. So with version two, I'm going to list all the research articles at the end and just dig out the odd interesting nugget. After all, the film is about showing where the road used to run and what's there now. The research links are in the description if you're watching this on YouTube. Nugget number one. The estate has passed through a lot of hands, including Henry VIII's grubby paws. One of the owners, William Longspeed Jr., granted turbary rights to local people. That's the right to cut turf for fuel, raise animals and hunt for game. The area to my right is called Turbury Common. I grew up around here and I didn't know the origin of the name until now. The estates has changed a lot over the centuries. It used to be all of Wimborne, all of Poole, and bits of where Bournemouth was going to be. It's had bits added and bits removed. The figure of 26.6 square miles I mentioned in the titles is the area of the estate in the 1800s when it was 17,000 acres, which is about 50 square kilometers. How long the road was comes from looking it up on old ordnance survey maps and tracing the route on Google Earth. This brings us neatly to the first stop the spot where the bridge was that we used to drive under when I was a boy. I remember the bridge well, but I have no memory of it coming down in the 1970s to widen this road. The great thing about online communities is people putting these memories online for everybody. It was quite a low bridge, so traffic used to get stuck under it on a regular basis, mostly buses and lorries, but one time a tank. So I need to say a quick thank you to the members of the Facebook group Memories of Old Pool and Bournemouth for finding the old photographs. Thanks guys. So this is the other side of the dual carriageway. The route of the road used to be directly to my right but that's long since reverted to nature. The nearest we can get to the route is to pop down to Belburn Road and pick it up later. The road was directly behind the north side of these houses in Belburn Road 
So let's see how close to the original route we can get. So this little bit of road takes us up to where the path used to be. However, what we'll find out is, might be okay if you want to walk. Ah, fuck. But if you want to go on a bike, you've got a few problems. Okay, so you can follow the route of the road by walking it, but we're going to have to go by the road. Whilst I'm cycling up this road, I'm going to briefly mention the most important people in the story. After all, they did build the road. Nugget number two. In 1198, the manor was owned by William Longsby. He was an illegitimate son of Henry II and half-brother to Richard the Lionheart. He met a sudden end, reputedly poisoned, and was the first person to be buried in Salisbury Cathedral. For some reason, his tomb was opened in 1791 and the well-preserved corpse of a black rat containing traces of arsenic was found inside his skull. The rat's now in Salisbury Museum. Make of that what you will. Back to the manor, and in 1848, Sir John Guest purchased the estate, plus some other bits of land, for £335,000. That's about £40 million today. The family business was the world's biggest ironworks near Merthyr Tidville. Not sure that he had any local connections, but he did have stacks of cash, and his new estate had the distinct advantage of not being right next to the world's biggest ironworks. His eldest son, Ivor, inherited the estate in 1852, and six years later married one Cornelia Spencer Churchill. Names familiar? Yep, that's the lot that owns Blenheim Palace. Some of the stuffier aristos probably didn't approve of the marriage as the groom was trade. But being trade and filthy rich opens doors for you, like being able to marry the daughter of a duke. Ivor was made Lord Wimborne in 1880, making Cornelia Lady Wimborne. More about her later. Thankfully, this is the end of the built-up bit and we get to ride the route of the road again. I'm glad to get off the road now. I much prefer riding on trails. Wait, I've done this route a few times now and this is really my favourite part. Despite living here all of my life, I've never really explored Camford Heath before making this film which is a real shame as it's incredibly beautiful. I see a few cyclists, joggers and dog walkers, but mostly I have it all to myself. Overshare. For older gentlemen cyclists who um, don't want to wear Lycra or their wives are banned them from wearing it, um, my tip is bamboo underwear. Brilliant. No splinters yet either. Here we go for the cattle grid. Whoa. So back to Lady Cornelia, two stories here. Story one, rich aristos having a lovely time and story two, rich aristos using their money for the public good. Story one, simple. They had estates in Dorset, Wales and Scotland plus their London pad. Lots of socialising and travel. Story two is much more interesting. They did a lot of public good with their money and there's still a lot of signs of that around. Before we get to the story, historical nugget number three. Winston Churchill was Cornelia's nephew. Aged 18, he was staying at Branxton Dean Chine, which was part of the estate. Him, his cousin and his younger brother were playing a game chasing over a bridge. And rather than get captured, Winston decided to climb over the edge of the bridge with the intention of sliding down one of the pines. He fell, was unconscious for three days and nearly died.
back to the story and Lady Wimborne allowed travellers to camp on the estate. The estate was big enough, but that wasn't the reason. There was a lot of industry on the estate, including potteries, brickworks and clay pits to supply them both. Industry and farmers relied on them for labourers and seasonal workers, and many families stayed on the estate for generations. Some of the encampment names live on. There are a few, but the ones I recognise are Monkey's Hump and Heavenly Bottom. Monkey's Hump is a steep hill where I used to take my kids to practice their hill starts when they were learning to drive. I know, I'm a bad parents. Some local names you'll know, all descended from families who lived on the estate. Special shout out to Charles Trent Scrapyard, we've just taken my daughter's first car up there. Nelson Stanley is also a big name in scrap metal and vehicle recycling. He lost a leg trying to retrieve a coin from one of his crushing machines. Bill Knott's first job was selling shoelaces and matchboxes. He established BK Bluebird and made caravans and park homes at his factory up at Newtown. You right. Like many wealthy Victorians, Ivor and Cornelia believed in using the money to benefit society. Not by building one big statement building and naming it after themselves, but by genuinely improving the lives of their tenants and benefiting the town in general. Cornelia did lots of work on her own and saw through projects started by her mother-in-law, Lady Charlotte Guest, both very strong women. Mum-in-law decided to improve the lives of her tenants by building them cottages with all mod cons. In the intro, I talked about visible signs of the estate. The most visible signs are the Lady Wimborne cottages, they built about 111 of them, mostly on Cornelia's watch. These are within 250 metres of my house. They built them literally everywhere, and this has been useful for verifying the estate boundaries. In Poole, you find them randomly scattered, including some in Hamworthy and along the road to Sandbanks. Quite a few properties still have restrictive covenants, including not annoying Lord Wimborne. Here's another sign of the past I see daily, 100 metres from my house. If I lose my cow, Lord Wimborne will tether it right here for me. Who knew? I didn't. I've never actually read the sign before doing this film. I just want to know what the definition of eyesore. Middle of the heathland. It's that. I mean, why? It doesn't exactly improve up there either, does it? Okay, let's not do that bit then. Given that Ivor was running the business and consistently trying to get himself elected to Parliament, Cornelia was the more active of the two in local life I think this is borne out because the cottages and road are named after Lady Wimborne, not either. The Education Act of 1870 made primary education compulsory for all, so they built schools at Hamworthy, Hampreston and Broadston. Hamworthy closed some years ago, but they reused the frontage in these new houses. The schools and houses are all of a similar design, so either they really liked the style, or their architect could only do Gothic, they also sold a lot of cheap land for development, but to stop speculation, they retained the right of first refusal in any sale. In 1885, they gave 26 acres on the edge of the harbour to the town for a park. It opened in 1890. The Prince of Wales was visiting, so Ivor asked him to perform the official opening. Things didn't go quite according to plan. The princess and her daughters all bunked off with severe colds. Ivor caught it too and took to his bed and a storm wrecked all of the decorations that people had prepared. The prince did open the park, but from the station booking office on his way back to London. In 1990, his grandson, also named Ivor, gave £30,000 for this fountain to commemorate the park's centenary. Apparently, Ivor also offered the town Sandbanks Peninsula free of charge. They turned him down. When I get my time machine, I'm going to go back and ask Ivor if I can have it if they don't want it. The same year the park opened, Cornelia got Ivor to buy this mansion house in Market Street and she turned it into a 30-bed hospital. 
Cornelia Hospital eventually moved to the site of the current hospital, which was built on land given to the town by Ivor and Cornelia. We're coming up to a fork in the road and I want to show you something. By the way, where I'm riding now is the new road and um, where we're coming up to, on the map we're going to use next, this road didn't exist. So X marks the spot of where we are now. So what you've got, this is a route um, the drive went. So she'll be coming along here in a carriage. And then you get to this corner. And you think it goes down there, but it doesn't. Where this one goes to is a place called Longfleet Lodge, which is um, on the edge of the town, uh, Camford Heath. I'll show you on a map in a minute. And it eventually um, goes right down, joins up with Derby's Lane and heads towards Poole. So we're not going that way today. Where we're going down is the other fort, which is here. This bit's quite interesting. Every time I've been down here, I've either fallen off or got myself scratched to bits of brambles. This section is quite short and takes us to Magna Road. You've got the posh houses of Arrowsmith Road on the left and farmers fields on the right. And the path is squeezed between the two. Although she had 12, four, although she had 14 men to sort of uh, do something with the path, I think this bit they missed. Okay, it's got a rather nice meadow over there. Skirt around this tree. Whoa, here we go. That's the worst bit of the whole drive. <laughs> Hi, all right. Thank you. Yes. So we're just coming up to Magna Road now. We'll talk a bit about um, the old, uh, the old and the new road. Okay, we're at Magna Road, looking at South Lodge. This gatehouse is on the old road that used to run between Longfleet Lodge and the Manor. So before they built the road we've been following, this was one of the main entrances to the park. Let's go this way a bit. This spot is where the old bridge crossed. It was demolished in 1976 and there's no visible sign of it now. The only way you can see where it was is by looking on Google Earth and following the line of trees. On this graphic, the old route to Longfleet Lodge is on the left in blue and the new road to Bournemouth is on the right. So this is the village of Camp at Magda coming up. The original road um, from Longfleet Lodge into the manor uh, was to the right of me behind this lot. And the new road was even further over to the right. There's some lovely old houses here. You can just imagine Miss Marple living here. It's Mock Tudor or Muda on them, I guess. Lovely old thatch cottage. And this is your typical Lady Wimborne architecture here. It's absolutely glorious in the, in the evening sun. No one around. So yeah, you can see that's nice, isn't it? Oh. This road takes us to one of the gatehouses. The main entrance is back in the village and this is as close as we can get to the manor. There's been a manor house here since Saxon times, maybe earlier. The church dates back to the 14th century. The estate was purchased by Ivor's dad in 1846 and his wife, Lady Charlotte, swiftly set about getting it remodelled by none other than Charles Barry, architect of the Houses of Parliament. He also did the gatehouses at the start of our journey. As with most of the great houses, fortunes declined. The iron works were sold in 1901 and Ivor died in 1914. Cornelia stayed on at the manor until 1922 and then downsized to Murley House selling the unprofitable parts of the estate, including the manor house, which became Camford School. She died in 1927. What she didn't know was that an Assyrian frieze on the tuck shop wall that everybody assumed was fake, wasn't. 
It was auctioned in 1994 for £7.7 .7 million, approximately £48 million today. The biggest sale of Canford Manor lands was the area we know as Canford Heath. The borough of Poole paid £7 million in 1973. That's about £85 million today. They developed the land and used some of the profits to part fund the swimming pool, sports centre and the arts centre. I'm never going to call it the lighthouse, it will always be the arts centre to me. Much of the rest of Camford Heath was sold to WH White, who run that refuse site we passed earlier. In 1999, Poole bought a chunk of the estate with help from the National Lottery Fund and it's now a nature reserve. The current fourth Viscount Wimborne is Ivor Guest. They obviously like that name. He's a famous record producer and composer. All right, thank you. I was going to let you have a go, go through and have a rest, so uh, <laughs> cheers. The road continues from the manor towards Wimborne. The bridge we are coming up to carried the railway between Wimborne and Hamworthy. It's very near to the gatehouse on Oakley Hill between Wimborne and the Willet Arms. This is my favourite time of day to see the bridge. Approaching sunset, the original bridge was replaced by mum-in-law as she wanted a grand entrance to the estate. Like the house and Wallace Down gatehouses, it was designed by Charles Barry. Him again. While they were about it, they tried to get Wimborne Station built nearer to the estate for their convenience. That didn't happen. The last train crossed in 1977 and it's now a Grade 2 listed building. Apart from the Wallace Down end that's been built on, and the Camford School end that's private, most of the drive is possible to walk, and we've cycled as much of it as we possibly can. Making this film has been very interesting for me. It's been great exploring a childhood memory and sharing the memories with others. I've even got fitter in the process and discovered a lot of good trails to ride. I hope you found it interesting and thanks for watching.